little cloudy outside um, going into holiday weekend. Um, next week, uh, Monday is Memorial Day. Uh, Tuesday conference at eight o'clock is uh, cardiology and M and M. Um, Dr. Moreno, um, and if there are cases um, to fill that, that would be great. Uh, Wednesday, Dr. Sean Pinney will talk about uh, heart failure at Mount Sinai, uh, past, present, and future. And Thursday, we have um, actually a day dedicated to wellness. The, uh, we have been asking those faculty members who potentially want to share with us what the single most impactful aspect of COVID in their lives moving forward. That I think will really be a very nice way to end this COVID uh, time of conferences that we've been having. And we have a very special conference on uh, June 1st. Uh, we'll tell you more about that. I mentioned it's a little cloudy uh, outside. Um, and we're pretty lucky that because air pollution is down, uh, we have a very low level of air pollution clouds, which raises um, uh, the topic of today, which is air pollution and cardiovascular disease. This is, uh, as Michael will tell us, one of the most important um, uh, killers in all of uh, the world. And with air pollution being down, with people being um, confined at home, uh, less carbon emission from all the airplanes and cars, there's actually been a reduction in air pollution, which has had a significant impact on general well-being and health despite this COVID crisis. Uh, I can't think of anyone better that we have in our institution than to really talk about the topic of air pollution, cardiovascular disease. Uh, Michael Hadley has an MPH from Harvard. Uh, we were privileged to have him as our fellow when we created a new position this year the sort of research uh, chief fellow, and, and he's been filling that role and really doing a great job. Uh, people may know that we, uh, our fellowship program is no longer going to the uh, VA, which was a very valuable rotation for some aspects of it. Uh, uh, but that time is being uh, put back into our program, uh, a lot of it for uh, additional research time. And Mike has been instrumental in developing a three-year uh, uh, comprehensive program uh, to get all of our fellows uh, on track uh, for very meaningful research. And this, I think, fulfills Dr. Fuster's dream of what our fellowship um, uh, should be. Um, I think people like Greg Stone, uh, Roxana Moran, other people are going to be very instrumental um, in the success of, of this program. Um, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, give the podium, the virtual podium over to Michael uh, to talk about air pollution and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and he'll tell us a little bit about what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will be doing. So thank you very much, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Goldman, uh, for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground today. I'll begin with a discussion of the magnitude of the problem and the nature of the specific air pollutants. Uh, and then we'll look at the pathophysiology of air pollution, how it leads to specific cardiac outcomes. Uh, we'll take a look at how this matters to us as clinicians in terms of risk assessment and interventions for our patients. And finally, um, I'll look at how the pandemic has affected air pollution and, and consequently um, cardiovascular health. And I'll try to leave some time for a discussion at the end. Uh, so I have one financial disclosure is that I'm a consultant for the WHO on this topic. Hello, Michael. Hey, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, uh, let's start off with uh, why this topic matters. So some numbers. Uh, air pollution exposures are estimated to be responsible for about 7 million deaths uh, worldwide. About 7 billion people are exposed to levels of ambient air pollution levels above recommended uh, WHO guidelines. And that's over 90% of the global population. Uh, these hazardous exposures are more common in low and middle income countries, but we also see them in developed urban centers like LA and, and New York and also industrial areas in our country. Um, overall, air pollution is the number five risk factor for global mortality. So you have hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, and then air pollution. Uh, so air pollution is responsible for, for more deaths than obesity, than renal disease, malnutrition, and, and other common risk factors. 
Uh, and these deaths, um, due to pollution, um, we expect to double by 2050. Uh, that's due largely to continued industrialization of developing countries and pollution in Asia mixed with uh, an aging global demographic um, with higher rates of non-communicable disease. Um, here's a comparison between air pollution and other commonly discussed threats to global health. So we can see air pollution now at bases AIDS, TB, malaria combined, as well as some other um, risk factors for mortality. Uh, this chart shows the top five causes of death attributed to air pollution exposure. Um, we can see the majority of deaths are from cardiovascular etiologies, specifically ischemic heart disease and stroke. Um, so somewhat contrary to common belief, heart disease, not lung disease, is, is really the major consequence of air pollution exposures. Um, and let's look specifically at cardiovascular mortality uh, from air pollution. So cardiovascular disease, uh, as we know, is the leading cause of death globally and in the U.S. It's responsible for about 18 million deaths annually worldwide. Uh, WHO attributes about 3.7 million cardiovascular deaths uh, to air pollution exposures annually, which is about one in five um, of all global cardiovascular deaths. Uh, when you look at severely polluted regions like India and China, uh, maybe upwards of one in three cardiovascular deaths are from air pollution in those, in those regions. It's lower in the US. Um, here, maybe one in 20 cardiovascular deaths are due to air pollution exposures or attributed to air pollution exposures. Um, across the country, about 44,000 cardiovascular deaths annually from air pollution. Um, and New York State specifically estimates are around 2,600 uh, annually from um, cardiovascular disease attributed to air pollution. And we can touch on how these numbers are calculated later. Um, the, uh, this chart shows the percent of cardiovascular deaths globally um, from different cardiovascular risk factors. So you can see air pollution is third here. Um, it's similar to diabetes and, and high cholesterol. Um, I should mention some of the hypertension here is probably attributable to air pollution itself. Uh, but right now it's number three. Um, and um, you might notice that uh, these numbers add up to more than 100%. That's because a lot of deaths are attributed to more than one risk factor. Um, so, uh, to summarize so far, the you know, air pollution, it's a clear gro uh, growing threat to global cardiovascular health. Um, let's look now at uh, the components of air pollution and, and how it leads to cardiovascular disease. There are a lot of different sources of air pollution. You know, major emitters are industry and vehicles that are burning fossil fuels. Um, some other ones to, to have on your radar, the burning of solid fuels indoors for cooking and heating is a critical source of exposure. Uh, it's responsible for around a third of all deaths attributed to air pollution. Um, we see that in low-income regions, you know, in Africa, um, but you also see it in Appalachia, where people are heating their homes with, um, you know, with, with firewood or cooking over fires. Um, some other major sources to consider include wildfires, prescribed burns, uh, like the recent fires in Australia and the Amazon, and uh, resuspended soil and dust, um, which is becoming more and more common with climate change and, and deforestation. There are a lot of different types, uh, specific components of, of air pollution. And these here that I'm listing are the main hazardous pollutants. Um, they include particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, black carbon, and gases uh, like ozone. Today, I really want to focus on particulate matter, uh, which is the pollutant with the strongest associations with cardiovascular disease. Um, so this particulate matter, PM, consists of these microscopic particles of solid or liquid matter, usually combination of elemental carbon, sulfate, nitrate, dust, transition metals, and um, complex yeah. organic molecules. molecules. And uh, this particulate matter can arise from um, all of the different sources that we discussed. Uh, particulate matter is classified into different categories based on size. Um, so particles that pass through a 2.5 micron filter are called PM 2.5, um, are also called fine particulate matter. It's basically anything smaller than a red blood cell, which coincidentally is anything that can pass through a capillary. Uh, just quickly to orient ourselves to different levels of PM 2.5 exposure. So across the entire USA, we average around nine micrograms per meter cubed. Um, that's just below the WHO uh, chronic exposure recommendation of 10. Here in New York City, some investigators estimate we're at about 12. Uh, average. Um, the WHO guideline for maximum exposure in a single day is 20. Uh, average chronic exposure across all of Asia um, and its 4 billion inhabitants is, is about 35. Right now the most polluted city on earth is, is New Delhi with average exposures of about 225. 
um, which is equivalent to around smoking 10 cigarettes per day for, for all 20 million inhabitants of New Delhi. Um, you know, Beijing gets a lot of press for air pollution. It currently clocks in at around, around 95. Uh, burning solid fuels indoors for cooking or heating, still practiced by about a billion people around the world and has a typical exposure of 300. Um, it can be a lot higher than that as well. And then uh, active smoking for comparison, you know, if you're drawing in on a cigarette, it has an exposure of about, about 1,000, which is similar to the maximum um, recorded levels on certain days in New Delhi. And the maximum recorded indoor exposures are much higher than that, 30,000 or, or even higher. Um, here's the global distribution of ambient um, PM 2.5. So we see the highest concentrations um, in highly polluted areas in Asia. And here's a close up of the United States. You can see the highest levels are in major urban centers like LA, um, as well as in industrial regions in the Midwest and regions with fewer pollution regulations like parts of the Southeast. Uh, this figure shows the distribution of global population according to PM 2.5 levels with a, a sort of a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. Uh, you can see India and China have the most people exposed to the highest levels of air pollution. Um, USA is blue here. Uh, again, the WHO recommended level for average exposures is, is 10, which is that first vertical dotted line. And you can see the vast majority of the global population is living above that level. So um, let's see, let's change gears now and look at the literature on how air pollution affects cardiovascular health. There's a lot of literature here. I'm gonna try and burn through some of the most uh, you know, salient features. Um, the watershed paper in this field is the Harvard Six Cities study, which was published in the New England Journal in, in 1993. It's a large uh, prospective cohort study of about 8,000 adults from six US cities that were followed for 15 years. Um, uh, investigators looked at an outcome of cardiopulmonary mortality, uh, which includes uh, several different ICD-9 codes for ischemic heart disease, stroke, heart failure, COPD, and, and pneumonia. And they used a, uh, a Cox Pro proportional hazards regression modeling, incorporating average annual air pollution exposures and a number of other individual risk factors, including smoking. And they demonstrated a clear relationship between exposure to PM2.5 and cardiopulmonary mortality with a hazard ratio of about 1.37 um, between the most and the least polluted city. Uh, additionally, they showed a clear relationship between, um, a clear linear relationship uh, really between PM2.5 exposure and the mortality for these six cities. You can see that figure in the lower right, P for Portage, Wisconsin, S for Steubenville, Ohio. Um, our figures have improved a lot since the 90s. And the extended follow-up of this cohort for 35 years continues to demonstrate um, a relationship between five particulate exposures and now a cardiovascular specific mortality. So since this study, there have been a number of other large, pretty well designed prospective cohort studies. I, we don't have time to go through these in detail, but just suffice it to say that, um, you know, they've refined our understanding of the association between PM 2.5 and, and a number of other specific cardiovascular outcomes like uh, coronary syndrome, stroke, and, and we'll touch on this. Um, I'll mention here at Sinai, we've uh, kind of thrown our hat in the ring with a cohort of our own. Um, the SPACE study is a, this is an NIH funded project looking at the impact of six different environmental risk factors, including air pollution on uh, cardiovascular events in a, in a well-characterized cohort of over 50,000 individuals um, that have been followed for 15 years in Iran. Um, what I think makes this trial kind of unique and interesting is that it's testing multiple environmental risk factors simultaneously, so we can explore confounding effect modification um, between these different risk factors. And the initial results from this trial should be out um, later this year. Uh, so continuing on, um, as evidence for air pollution is mounted, you know, from all these studies, professional organizations have started releasing some important uh, consensus documents. So in, in 2010, the AHA released this comprehensive review of the literature, which, which I recommend taking a look at. Um, an expert panel concluded that there is a causal and modifiable relationship between PM2.5 and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Uh, the ESC followed a few years later with a similar statement, writing that air pollution should be viewed as one of several major modifiable risk factors in the prevention and management of cardiovascular disease. Um, along with these cohort studies and professional statements, there have been an explosion of of research into the underlying mechanisms and pathophysiology for how air pollution leads to these outcomes. And some of this has been done here at Sinai. 
Um, I want to get into this now. So the mechanisms I'll discuss here have uh, been borne out by a wealth of studies in, in human and in animal models. So first, uh, air pollution is inhaled, uh, or it acts on the lungs and then enters the systemic circulation. Um, in the lungs and at remote sites, you get immune cell activation, local tissue damage leading to free radicals, oxidative stress, inflammation, activation of thrombotic pathways. Uh, and the pollutants may also act on receptors to activate these neural reflex arcs and, and stimulate autonomic imbalance. Chronic exposure to this kind of stress um, leads to the development of traditional cardiovascular risk factors like vasoconstriction, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, and also um, some less traditional risk factors, epigenetic modifications, activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, which gives you increased glucocorticoid production and adipose inflammation, insulin resistance, et cetera. Um, and, and this way, these air pollution exposures lead to a progression of um, some subclinical cardiovascular states, atherosclerosis, myocardial fibrosis, um, systemic and pulmonary hypertension, uh, shown in green there. Um, I just want to take a minute to look at a few of the key investigations and meta-analyses that have looked at the impact of air pollution on, on these subclinical states. Um, so this is uh, one of four recent meta-analyses that examine the relationship between blood pressure and air pollution. And the conclusion is that uh, an increase in PM2.5 by about 10 micrograms per meter cubed um, is consistently associated with an increase of between one and three points in systolic and diastolic blood pressure uh, over the ensuing few days. Um, chronic air pollution exposures are also linked to chronic elevations in blood pressure, but it's, um, the, the amount is, is more varying in the literature. Um, elevated glucose, a meta-analysis combining about 2 million cases found that uh, the relative risk for diabetes increased by about 10% per 10 micrograms or meter cubed of increased PM2.5 exposure. Atherosclerosis. Uh, this is a key early study from Mount Sinai that demonstrated how air pollution exposures accelerate atherosclerosis. So this is a team including Dr. Fuster, Dr. Fayad, and others who examined changes in aortic plaque area in mice that were exposed to PM2.5 um, uh, versus filtered air. And they found that mice exposed to PM2.5 had significantly larger aortic plaques, increased plaque lipid content, and macrophage infiltration um, and some exaggerated responses to vasoconstrictors. And then more recently, there have been meta-analyses of all, all these different studies that demonstrated significant increases in carotid intima media thickness with particulate matter exposure. Um, and some other studies have demonstrated increases in coronary artery calcium scores also in response to long-term uh, PM2.5 exposures. Uh, lastly, myocardial fibrosis. A number of studies have looked at um, how air pollution exposure leads to cardiac findings that you can see on echocardiography or cardiac MRI. Uh, this is an investigation from the MESA study, which demonstrated uh, left ventricular hypertrophy associated with traffic-related pollution. Um, other studies like this have shown right ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular dilatation, diastolic dysfunction, uh, increases in the left atrial volume in index, all associated with increased exposure to air pollution uh, in humans. And studies in mice like this one um, have found that a likely mechanism for um, these echocardiographic findings is, is non-ischemic myocardial fibrosis, where air pollution is leading to oxidative stress and inflammation, elevated blood pressure, hyperglycemia, upregulation of some of some profibrotic genes. And together this results in an accumulation of myocardial collagen. And this myocardial fibrosis from air pollution has, has been well documented in mice, but it hasn't really been documented or studied in humans. Um, we have a small amount of funding to study this exact question next year um, to look for an independent association between air pollution exposures and non-ischemic myocardial fibrosis uh, on cardiac MRI. This is the proposed study design. Uh, so uh, just continuing with our discussion of the pathophysiology, um, we've discussed how these chronic exposures lead to the development of subclinical disease, 
Um, and then, of course, these individuals who've reached that state can cross over into having acute cardiovascular events, here shown in orange. Um, and the acute air pollution exposures um, can trigger these cardiovascular events in susceptible individuals. Uh, so acute exposures to air pollution can lead to increases in sympathetic tone, heart rate, um, increased blood pressure, increased myocardial oxygen demand. They also, uh, acute pollution exposures can trigger prothrombotic pathways and platelet activation. You can get decreased fibrinolysis, endothelial dysfunction, um, rupturing of, of atherosclerotic plaques. And some, some have characterized this, these acute effects as harvesting where air pollution is harvesting cardiac events in predisposed individuals who have subclinical disease. And ultimately, um, you know, these pathways lead us to cardiovascular outcomes, um, ACS, stroke, mortality. Um, ACS, stroke, and mortality have kind of the, the greatest evidence base, but evidence is building for other outcomes like arrhythmias and decompensated heart failure. Um, let's look a little deeper at some of these specific outcomes, uh, looking at some of the large cohort studies uh, and meta-analyses. Um, I'm going to run through these for the sake of time, but um, you might notice that the relative risks here are, are somewhat unimpressive, but just remember that we're talking about billions of people exposed to air pollution. So even though the, the individual risk is quite small, it ends up adding up to you know, a significant uh, burden of disease. Um, so looking at mortality, cohort studies, this is cardiovascular mortality, cohort studies have demonstrated an increase of uh, about 10 micrograms per meter cubed in chronic PM2.5 exposure can lead to a relative risk increase in cardiovascular mortality by about, about 10% across studies. And uh, on the other hand, a, a, a reduction in long-term PM2.5 exposure by 10 um, is associated with an increased life expectancy of about 0.61 years in this study published in the New England Journal. Looking at uh, myocardial infarction, um, one of the more renowned cohorts is this escape cohort of over 100,000 individuals across multiple centers, which showed a 13% increase in the relative risk of MI with just a 5 uh, microgram per meter cubed elevation and long-term PM2.5 exposure. So, you know, in the U.S., that's kind of like the difference between living in the suburbs or living in the city. Um, and a similar meta-analysis of 34 studies showed short-term PM2.5 exposure acute exposures increase the relative risk of MI by about 2.5% per 10 micrograms per meter cubed exposure. Looking at stroke, the data here is a, a little less um, consistent across studies, but the systematic review um, showed uh, an increase of about 1% in relative risk in response to an increase of uh, acute exposure above 10. You know, some, some other quality studies have demonstrated much higher relative risks. And then looking at heart failure, uh, the Lancet published this systematic review and meta-analysis of 35 studies, which showed a 2% increase in the relative risk of, of heart failure hospitalization or mortality um, for a short-term increase of PM2.5 of, of 10. And I also want to mention this recent publication in JAK, which has gotten a lot of press, which demonstrated for the first time that there is an association between air pollution exposures and mortality in patients um, after heart transplant. Um, the authors found a hazard ratio for mortality of 1.26 uh, per an increase in PM2.5 of 10 after adjusting for 30 variables. And that's a greater effect than seen in the general population, maybe because um, PM2.5 exposure can induce systemic immune activation, which is a mechanism for solid organ rejection. Lastly, uh, arrhythmia. So this is... Um, I think the most cited meta-analysis of four different studies combining about half a million participants, which showed close to a 1% increase in the population attributable risk of AFib um, with each uh, 10 microgram per meter cubed increase in PM2.5. So those are the five cardiovascular outcomes with the best evidence so far. Um, there are a few others under investigation. These include peripheral arterial disease, uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmia, as I should mention, um, pregnancy-related blood pressure complications, and some other diseases re related to the cardiometabolic syndrome, like obesity, sleep apnea, um, CKD. Um, okay. So uh, let's change gears and just think more about our role as clinicians. So realistically, what can we really do about air pollution exposures affecting our patients? 
Right now, I think there are kind of two barriers for clinicians. The first is risk assessment. Like how do we identify patients that are at elevated risk of heart disease from air pollution? And the second is intervention. You know, even if we identify a patient or a population that's at elevated risk, what can we really do about it? And I think we're just getting to the point where we can begin incorporating this topic into certain clinical scenarios. Um, and eventually, I think over the course of our careers, I expect that risk assessment and intervention targeting air pollution is likely to become a standard, maybe maybe an unavoidable part of clinical practice. Um, and I don't think this is going to be as foreign as it might sound. Um, so I just want to do, let's do a quick experiment. So imagine you see, you see a new patient in clinic, 65-year-old, um, bit overweight, complains of a few months of shortness of breath with exertion, um, and, and doesn't have any other symptoms or past medical history or physical exam findings. Someone like this, like, what's your pretest probability for CAD? Okay, now, what if I told you that he just moved here from Bangladesh last month? Right, like, what does that do to our pretest probability? You know, it probably increased. Now, remember this map from earlier um, depicting global air pollution exposures. Where is Bangladesh, right? You'll notice at the bottom that it's the country with the highest average pollution exposures on Earth. Now, I, I, don't, I don't want to imply that all the CAD we see in Bengali patients is due to air pollution. I, I think it's certainly much more complicated, right, involving complex interactions between genetics and environment and diet. Um, but my point is just this, that when we factor someone's location into our pretest probability, we, we're already incorporating a lot more than just race and ethnicity. We're actually incorporating a whole lifetime of environmental exposures. You know, we're kind of already doing this. Um, but let's talk about how we can approach risk assessment from air pollution uh, a bit more formally. We want to identify individuals at highest risk. Um, so these are patients that fall at this intersection of susceptibility and vulnerability. Vulnerability meaning they're exposed to high levels of hazardous pollution and susceptibility meaning they're at higher risk of having cardiac events for a given level of air pollution exposure. And the cohort studies have mapped out these susceptible groups pretty well. Um, they include young children, adults over 60, uh, minority groups, um, groups from lower socioeconomic status, and importantly, our patients who have pre-existing cardiac risk factors and atherosclerotic disease. Um, we can assess for, you know, hazardous pollution exposures in, in these patients. I think if we want to, you know, kind of conserve resources, um, and this can be done qualitative or quant qualitatively or quantitatively. Uh, this is a screening tool that we developed to assess for some key air pollution exposures. Um, key screening questions here are well-established predictors of hazardous exposures, like burning solid fuels at home. Um, these questions can be performed along standard questions that clinicians are already asking. And this tool is being tested in Ghana. It's you know, probably more directed for um, the developing world. Um, but you know, if you have a new patient from a low-income country, you might ask whether they burn solid fuels in their home, just like you might ask about whether they used to smoke cigarettes. Um, and then let's talk about quantifying risk, which I think is what we'd really like to do. Um, to do this, we first have to quantify exposure and then turn this into an estimate of, of cardiovascular risk. And we can do this in a number of different ways. Um, we can estimate acute and chronic exposures by looking at a patient's location like their home address uh, on an exposure map. And there's a lot of good platforms that can do this using satellite data or ground monitoring stations. Um, and as a side, I should mention that we have some of the best pollution geographers in the world here at Mount Sinai, actually, in the Department of Environmental Health and, and Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health, um, setting the standard for the development of these kinds of, of models. Um, and of course, these kind of pollution maps have now been made publicly available for personalized electronic devices. Apple Watch can link to pollution maps, which give people an estimate of their current air pollution exposures. Um, and these are really popular applications. You can see that uh, this Air Visual app has received positive reviews from over 182,000 people. And uh, a lot of these apps also try to educate people on the health risks of pollution, um, and sometimes in, in misleading ways. Uh, but it's going to get even more personalized than this. So some companies now have developed wearable pollution monitors that quantify your exposures as you go around town. So it's not looking at a map and estimating your exposure. It's you know monitoring, picking up your exposure um, from this device that you carry with you. 
And Apple and Google hold patents for this kind of technology. Um, and I suspect it won't be too long before your iPhone or your Apple Watch has a sensor for your individual environmental exposures like air pollution. Um, you know, there's some questions about validity and reproducibility with these devices, but uh, they are improving. I mean, I, you know, we've, we've all had patients who want to discuss the telemetry on their Apple Watch. Um, I think in, you know, not too distant future, we may have individuals who want to discuss the air pollution exposures that their iPhone has warned them about. Um, there are also some biomarkers um, under investigation, uh, which might give us an, another way to accurately estimate uh, exposures, things like uh, levels in blood, urine, saliva, exhaled air. Um, so let's just get back to risk assessment in the clinical setting. Uh, if we know the exposure um, to a patient or a population, how can we quantify the associated risk? Um, so in recent years, um, these exposure response curves have been developed, and these combine data from a number of different cohort studies to produce a function that estimates the risk of an outcome for different levels of exposure. Each point here is representing a different cohort study, and you can see the function that, that's fitted to this data. This is the exposure response curve for the combined outcome of stroke and ischemic heart disease. These curves are available for different diseases and for different age groups and countries all over the world. Um, a couple key points about this curve. First is that the relative risk reaches one only when exposure reaches zero. So there really is no level of exposure above zero deemed safe. And second, that the curve plateaus at higher exposure levels. So you know, in really polluted areas, you have to reduce pollution dramatically in order to produce a health benefit. Whereas in a place like New York, when you're farther down in the curve, on the steeper part of the curve, a small reduction in exposure can translate into a bigger benefit in, in health. Um, using these exposure response curves, we can estimate relative risk of cardiovascular events for a population. Um, a nice way to display this information is with risk mapping. Um, here we demonstrated the risk of ischemic heart disease mortality from PM2.5 in New York City based on different exposure levels across the city. You can see how elevated risk is the highest in high population density regions and also along major roadways like I-95. And this is a mock-up, but um, some researchers, some researchers um, here at Sinai are interested in making this kind of information easily available through the EMR. So it's just interesting to think about. You, know, you can imagine Epic using a patient's home address to categorize them into different risk categories based on, based on their environmental exposures. And you could do this not just with air pollution, but with other environmental risk factors like neighborhood socioeconomic status or distance to the nearest PCI center. And you can imagine this being particularly important in the era of accountable care organizations, where if a hospital has a better sense of the risk in its service population, then it can direct resources to the most vulnerable populations and prevent disease and, prevent disease and, and maybe increase profitability. Um, I should mention there are caveats to these methods. Um, these are relying on population, de population data, right? So individuals that are significantly different from the population may have a very different relative risk for a given exposure. And there are other unanswered questions about precision and, and accuracy. Um, but subgroup analyses and different cohort studies is getting us closer to being able to individualize the exposure response relationship, but we're not there yet. Um, I think the holy grail would be something like uh, a risk calculator that incorporates different cardiac risk factors and also air pollution exposure to provide an absolute risk, not just a relative risk of cardiovascular outcomes. And we're not here yet, certainly, but the wheels are in motion. And let's move, lastly, to interventions. Um, so if we have a patient that's susceptible to air pollution, you know, maybe it's an elderly woman with known CAD, lives next to I-95, um, what can we do? Um, so there's, you know, for cardiologists, we're used to randomized trials, uh, really well-designed studies. And we're not where we need to be in terms of having a strong evidence base for, for making decisions on, on intervening on air pollution. Um, I'll go through some of the data, um, but you know, there's more work to be done here. There's a, about a dozen trials that have looked at specific interventions on air pollution exposures, and some have promising results. But in general, these trials are en enrolling a small number of participants, often less than 100, and they look only at intermediate endpoints, um, like um, subclinical disease markers or biomarkers, um, not at heart outcomes like cardiovascular mortality. 
Um, and often they're performed in areas that have higher exposure levels, like in, in Asia, um, different from what we experience here. And I think these are good hypothesis generating studies, but they need to be backed up by larger trials. Um, let me just run through a few examples. So here's three different inter interventions. Uh, we'll talk about studies for each. So the use of face masks. Um, so this is a trial from China. Um, it's an, it was an open crossover trial enrolling 98 patients with known coronary disease. And they wore a respirator uh, when ambulating down a route in Beijing. And then they went through a brief washout period and then walked the same route without a mask. And the authors here found that the mask led to a small but significant reduction in blood pressure and a reduction in maximal ST segment depression, and also an increase in heart rate variability. And it's another small uh, crossover trial, only just 26 patients. Um, these are all patients with a known heart failure who were willingly exposed to diesel exhaust while wearing and then while not wearing a filtration mask. And diesel exhaust exposure without the mask on uh, increased um, BNP levels, reactive hyperemia, and then when they put the mask on, yeah, it, it significantly reduced reactive hyperemia and BNP levels in the presence of diesel exhaust. I think air purifiers are a promising technology. Um, this is a randomized double-blinded crossover trial of 35 college students who uh, were randomized to functional versus sham air purifiers for two hours with a two-week washout period and then monitored for 14 circulating biomarkers. And the investigators found that the air purification system cut PM2.5 exposures in half, uh, which was associated with um, several inflammatory and thrombogenic biomarkers um, like myeloperoxidase. Um, there's also a significant decrease in blood pressure. Uh, this is another study on, on air filtration. Similar design, um, looking at 45 healthy middle-aged adults that used um, that burned wood indoors for cooking and heating. Um, and these participants, again, were randomized to air filters in a crossover design, monitored for biomarkers. And uh, air filtration devices here significantly improved uh, reactive hyperemia and significantly decreased levels of, of CRP in these patients. Uh, lastly is um, clean burning stoves. So uh, this is the RESPIRE trial. Um, and this is um, one of the first trials really that was done in the space of air pollution. Here the investigators um, identified 534 households in Guatemala using uh, indoor wood fires for cooking. Um, the households were randomly assigned to receive a chimney with a hood to vent smoke out of the household. And this intervention was associated with um, about a three-point reduction in diastolic blood pressure among the women in the households, and that was a significant drop. Uh, and this is a, a similar trial out of Nigeria that looked at 300 pregnant women who were cooking with firewood. To um, These women were randomized to either an ethanol stove um, or just to continue using their solid fuel stoves. And um, then they monitored blood pressure. And over the course of several months, there was a small but, but a significant improvement in diastolic blood pressure uh, in the intervention arm. So just to summarize some of these interventions, you know, the, the existing trials, I think, have shown some, some thought-provoking results, um, but they're small. Uh, they're looking at intermediate markers, not true cardiac outcomes. So I think this is a real opportunity, you know, for all the excellent trialists that we have here at Mount Sinai, this is really a field ripe with opportunity. Um, and let me just talk about a few other potential recommendations we could provide our patients. And these are things recommended by the AHA and the ESC statements. Um, so simple behavior changes. Uh, High-risk patients, we can connect them to alert systems on their phones that can notify them of, on days when pollution levels are, are really elevated. Um, on these days, patients can take extra care to avoid traffic um, and rush hour, keep the windows closed on their homes and cars, decrease penetration of outdoor pollution into the indoor space, uh, and, and minimize their time outdoors. Some trials are looking at the use of cardioprotective medications for patients in high pollution areas like antioxidants or omega-3 fatty acids. Um, there have shown some signals towards improving endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress, but the results remain mixed. And again, no studies on hard outcomes. Um, and then lastly, you know, one of the best things we can do is just continuing to manage um, CVD risk factors. 
um, simply because this will reduce the susceptibility of our patients to air pollution exposures, to having a cardiac event triggered by air pollution. Um, at the community level, you know, this isn't something a lot of us do day to day, um, but I think as clinicians, we have a responsibility to advocate for these kinds of changes. Um, key interventions that are going to bring down air pollution worldwide are regulations and taxes and penalties and offsetting programs that will reduce emissions. Um, this includes switching to renewable energy sources like wind and geothermal and solar. We need zoning laws that will separate people from emission sources. Um, we need community air quality monitoring systems with alert networks that people can tap into, particularly in the developing world. And uh, we probably need some, some better media campaigns, similar to those that worked for smoking uh, to miti mitigate the effects of lobbying um, by the automobile, automobile industry, the power industry. Um, and lastly, I think it's important in the era of climate change to look at co-benefits, um, you know, policies that are directed at climate change um, should be looked at their co-benefits on, on health and on cardiovascular health. Um, getting close to the end here, so research priorities, you know, there's a few key priorities. I think I've touched on these. The most important, I think, is the development of large-scale randomized trials, um, looking at hard, hard, hard cardiovascular outcomes like ACS and mortality. Um, interventions that we really need to test are, are face masks, um, indoor air purification systems, and maybe, maybe even medications. I think another key research priority is the development of a risk calculator or another validated screening tool that we can use in clinic to, to estimate the risk of the patients that we see. Um, okay. Uh, all right, lastly, so as requested, I wanted to conclude with, um, with just a brief discussion of air, air pollution during the current pandemic. Um, here's a few sets of satellite images. These are from the European Sentinel 5P satellite. Um, this is looking at uh, NO2 emissions. Um, this is a, another hazardous pollutant that tracks with PM2.5. Uh, so this is Asia. Um, we see reductions in air pollution near the major population centers in China and India and elsewhere and in uh, major industrial regions as well. This is North America um, before and during the pandemic. Again, we're seeing the same thing. And this is our neck of the woods here. Um, again, we're seeing a significant reduction in air pollution across the tri-state area um, from December 21st to March 20th, um, largely driven, we think, by reductions in industrial and vehicle emissions. Um, on top of this, you've, you've also got millions of people staying indoors. And when people do go outdoors, they're wearing face masks, and often those are N95. So, Overall, uh, you know, pollu population exposure to air pollution is probably lower than it's been in many, many years. Um, so I've received a few questions about this. Um, I'm, I want to cover three. Um, so is is this reduction leading to improvements in cardiovascular health? So it certainly makes sense that it would, um, but we don't have the data yet to confirm or quantify it. Um, in some ways, this is the largest scale experiment ever in terms of in terms of the reduction in, in emissions. And we have a pretty good understanding of how elevations elevations exposure harm health. Um, but I'm hoping that this period will also give us an opportunity to study you know, how much and how quickly reductions in exposure can lead to improvements in health because the, the research there is is a little bit more mixed or, or lacking. So so stay posted. I think you know a lot of people are looking at this we'll know soon. Um, how much cardiovascular health has benefited from these reductions. Uh, and then a, a related question that comes up is um, whether this reduction in air pollution um, is the reason we're seeing fewer people presenting with acute events, um, why we're maybe having less people coming in with STEMI. Um, so I, you know, the jury's out. It's probably a factor. I highly doubt it explains the significant drop in volume that a lot of centers have seen, simply because in the U.S., you know, only a fraction of ACS cases are attributable to air pollution in the first place. Um, I think a lot of other factors uh, are playing a role as well, like just the fact that people are more scared to come to the hospital. Um, but again, we are going to know more, and I'm happy to I'm happy to circle back once we have that data. Uh, and just the very last question I'll answer is whether 
um, whether air pollution exposures are increasing susceptibility to COVID infection. And here we do have, we have some initial data. So there's a group at Harvard that's released initial findings of a nationwide cross-sectional study that uses a regression model to look at COVID mortality rates at the county level uh, from a variety of different cofact um, risk factors, including PM2.5 exposure. And these guys have adjusted for a lot of different cofactors, performed 68 separate sensitivity analyses. And through this, they, they have found a significant association between pollution exposure and COVID mortality. Um, so they're documenting that an increase in PM2.5 by just one microgram per meter cubed contributed to an 8% increase in the COVID death rate after controlling for other, other confounders. And uh, that's a pretty big effect. You know, this is an ecological study that's vulnerable to confounding. Um, it's not yet through the peer review process, but there are similar reports starting to come out from other regions as well, out of Northern Italy and China. There are also articles in press. And I, I, it sounds like a lot. I don't think it's necessarily surprising when you look at the effect of PM2.5 on other infectious respiratory diseases. Um, you also you know, see a potentiation in the severity of influenza, of pneumonia, of SARS. Uh, so in China, for example, areas that were had higher pollution rates had SARS fatality rates twice that of low pollution areas. And mechanistically, air pollution does cause inflammation. It may improve viral entry. It may also suppress early immune responses to infection. So it's it's mechanistically plausible. Um, and so, you know, what that means is that this reduction in pollution produced by the lockdown may be one of the things keeping us safe also during the during the pandemic. Uh, so those are the three questions I had about about COVID. Um, Michael? Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm going to end here, but go ahead, Dr. Goldman. I see. Um, I think Robert Wright, um, MDP, MDMPH, who's the chair of Department of Preventive Medicine, uh, may be on the line. Uh, Dr. Wright. Are you there? Can you unmute your phone? Dr. Wright? Ah, I saw him on. I wanted him to just comment on some of the work that his department is doing and your collaboration. Um, can you just tell us, Michael, how we go from PM 2.5 to inhalation and getting from the lungs into the endovascular tree um, causing heart disease. Just make that connection for us. Sure. Um, I think I have a, another, yeah, another slide about this. So, um, you know, the first place that the blood goes after it leaves the lungs is the heart, right? So, uh, and we're talking about small particulate matter that can cross into um, alveolar capillaries and then travel into the systemic circulation. So, these pollutants, you know, arrive in the heart and then on to, to other organs. And there is a lot of research in different animal models um, that have demonstrated different mechanisms for how this leads to different subclinical cardi cardiovascular disease. I mean, it focuses mainly on um, inflammation, oxidative stress, and also the activation of these neural reflex arcs. Um, you know, you get immune system activation, fibrosis, plaque, uh, plaque development, um, and the whole cascade of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, in addition to myocardial fibrosis. Um, does that answer ways, your question? Are there, no, are there better ways um, at the pulmonary circuit level of preventing entry? Um, that, doesn't sound like anything that has been looked at. It's looked at, you know, a mask or um, air filters, uh, HEPA and, and all these other type of air filters. Um, but are more people susceptible, whether it be genetically or if they smoke, um, to damage their pulmonary uh, lining where it makes it more susceptible uh, to air pollution? Um. I can't speak about whether individuals have genetically increased susceptibility to pulmonary damage from air pollution. 
Um, you know, for cardiovascular disease, certainly there are groups that are more susceptible. Um, you know, older age groups, people who already have underlying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, I think the genetic question is very interesting, but I'm not aware of I'm not aware of good data on that. Can you tell us about? Okay, this? can you hear me? Sorry. Hi, is this Dr. Wright? Yeah, I'm sorry, I had trouble on muting. Excellent. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Robert Wright is MD, MPH, uh, and he is the chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine at Icon School of Medicine. He actually succeeded Philip Landrigan, who was a pioneer in the field, um, and we're so pleased. And I know that um, Dr. Wright um, has um, agreed to uh, collaborate and mentor um, from his area into cardiovascular medicine, working uh, with Dr. Hadley. So thank you very much for being on the phone. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective of the field of um, air pollution and cardiovascular disease and what your section is doing? Thank you. Dr. Sure. Uh, well, first, I just want to um, thank Michael for that wonderful talk. That was actually a very good summary of what is actually a really large body of literature. So he did a very nice job of summarizing it. Uh, what we're doing in um, the department and the Institute for Exosomic Research is we've set up a center for geospatial analysis that actually creates air pollution models. And we have a model for the greater New York area. We have a model actually for the entire United States. Um, we have models in different parts of the world. We have a model in Italy, because we have a study going on in Italy. We have a model in Mexico City. We have a study there and another in Israel because uh, we have some studies there. So we actually have uh, quite a bit of data on air pollution measures going back about 20 years. Most of these models are created with satellites and so the model can start whenever the satellite was, was launched. So most of these use uh, the MODIS satellite, which went up in 2000, but we can get daily estimates of air pollution, uh, particularly PM 2.5, uh, going back all the way to the year 2000. Uh, in many, many parts of the world, including you know the catchment area for Mount Sinai. Uh, and we also have uh, a um, metabolomic laboratory, which is really an exosomic laboratory. So we can measure both metabolites and uh, environmental chemicals. Uh, there really isn't a biomarker right now for air pollution, but we can measure the metabolic response to air pollution. And a lot of it actually is part of the pathway between you know, exposure and heart disease, particularly things like insulin resistance. So that's actually, actually stuff that we can measure on a very large scale as well. But that's, that's what we're doing right now. And we're very eager for collaboration. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about the imaging that you were discussing that you're going to be doing next year? And how does uh, imaging uh, help identify areas of potential air pollution damage and cardiovascular disease? Sure. Well, um, uh, I'm pleased to have the collaboration with uh, Dr. Larakis, um, who kind of sponsored my application for um, the grant to investigate um, myocardial fibrosis uh, due to air pollution um, in humans. And we're hoping to use MRI images um, to look for fibrosis associated with pollution exposures. Um, we have to find the right data set to do that with. Um, there's a number of MRIs here. I'm not sure if it's going to be enough to power the study. Um, I've reached out to the MESA study, which um, has thousands of cardiac MRIs as well, although not all of them have the T2 maps that we need um, to look for fibrosis. Uh, but once we have that data set and we um, get the appropriate um, covariates into the model, um, I'm hoping that we'll see a signal um, that shows, you know, association of fibrosis um, with air pollution exposures, as has been demonstrated clearly in, in rodent models, but never before in humans. So that's that's kind of what I'm hoping to do next year. Um, you know, there there's literature on every different cardiovas um, cardiovascular imaging modality and um, air pollution exposures. I think a lot of the really interesting studies that I've seen that are sort of the most well developed are. Uh, in the field of, of echo. Um, I think the MESA study is like the one that I pointed out that shows um, left ventricular hypertrophy um, 
due to air pollution exposures is, is a good example. Um, but there's, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to use cardiac imaging to understand kind of the intermediate steps in terms of how inhaling air pollution leads all the way to cardiac, cardiac outcomes. If, if Dr. Sharma's on the phone, um, if Dr. Sharma and Kimmy can maybe comment on a lot of the Asian patients that they see um, that were always querying why these young people um, have uh, significant coronary disease. Is there a lot of work being done in India uh, on air pollution and cardiovascular disease? Do you know of any, Dr. Wright? Uh, yes, there's actually quite a bit of research and one of our faculty, Itai Klug, is actually involved in modeling in India as well. So it is something that is currently being done. Our department's part of it. Yeah, Valentin here. Uh, we are working together on the five borders of New York, actually with children. We applied to NIH and one of the projects has to do actually with the modeling that you have been talking about uh, pollution and how the impact that this can have. I'd like to have uh, to, to have few comments about it because the, um, and I think you will agree with that, is across the world, pollution is now considered even above the smoking in terms of the impact in cardiovascular disease. This is across the world in general. And then the, the second issue that perhaps it was not discussed, uh, was an excellent presentation, by the way, Michael. But one issue is that this is a political issue. Either you believe in the environment or you don't. And one of the great frustrations of this country is that the politicians, some of them, are completely ignoring what we are talking about. When in fact, if you go back to the history of the smoking, the great impact that the smoking had in society was about the people who thought passive smoking could affect them. So I think we have to go into the same direction that this pollution can affect us and then see if we can go to Congress and really have a much more impact, but it's absolutely frustrating to see how politicians don't pay attention to something that has a huge impact actually on health. And, and frankly, at the individual level, uh, that you, Mike, have been talking about, we can talk here or there, but it's more of a something that is out of us, really. And, and I think I just want to emphasize is a political level. In the month of November, in Jack, we will have the impact of smoking and the impact of pollution across the world. And I can tell you, it's going to be very exciting, but basically I can give you the bottom line. This is a, ID, huge, followed by pound. It's a huge risk factor, as well as, a, as worse, and perhaps worse than smoking. I wanted to um, just give Mike uh, a, a minute to um, summarize, uh, you know, why he got interested in this, and um, does he think that this opportunity with the reduction in air pollution that we're seeing now is an opportunity um, to invigorate the politicians, as Dr. Fuster said, and the world, um, to how important it is uh, to have lower uh, air pollution um, so that we can improve general uh, cardiovascular health. Uh, but this was a fantastic talk, and, and I think I know Dr. Fuster, and certainly I am very proud um, that one of our fellows was really uh, able to put together uh, this and is really making this his uh, life's work and passion. Mike, this was a superb talk and a great introduction to so many of us who know very little about the field and really looking forward uh, to hearing continued uh, updates from you on this topic. So any closing comments, Michael? Um, no, thank you all I, I, for you know your attention to this issue. I think it, it means a lot to have so many people um, listening in and learning about it. And I think it's gonna, it's just going to be a really exciting few decades here as we learn more about the impact of, of air pollution on heart disease. And to your point, um, Dr. Goldman, I think you know with the reductions in pollution from the pandemic. Um, and the research that's likely to follow from that, showing the benefits in health. Um, people might not want to go back to the elevated levels from before. Um, so it will be an interesting time um, and maybe a motivating factor um, 
for political change, is, which is so important, as, as Dr. Fuster pointed out. So thanks very much. It's very exciting seeing you, Dr. Wright, Dr. Fuster, lead the way, um, both uh, in cardiovascular research as well as uh, politically. Um, thank you, everyone, very much. Have a great holiday weekend. Uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, be safe. Be well. Thank you.